I'm going to start the portion of the service of this LDMBC by removing the oil filter and showing how to change the oil filter on this 220 CFM air compressor. First thing you'll need is a 13 millimeter wrench or ratchet with socket to remove the four fasteners. This oil filter is a bathed type oil filter inside of this canister and you'll need to remove the four fasteners. You'll either have four bolts or three bolts and the nut on a stud as you see as you see here. This is just a nut on a stud. The purpose of that is so that you can actually remove the three other bolts and when removing those three other bolts the remaining stud and nut will actually hold on to and help you center up the assembly. Remove the canister and then the oil filter itself is on an o-ring. There's an o-ring seal inside of here and it just fits onto a seat on the inside. You press it onto that fitting and uh, until your O-ring seats and you feel this surface area bump up against the surface on the bottom of that uh, housing. And this oil filter uh, looks good. You'd want to put a small little film of oil on this O-ring before reseating it into place. Pushing it up into place as you see here just the, the pressure of the O-ring and the seat itself will hold it into position and then you can put the canister back into place. There will be a small amount of oil in the canister when removing it but um, not so much that it will uh, not so much that it will make a mess. And then just uh, reposition all of your, re replace all the bolts. I think before I put it back on I want to show you what that surface looks like inside. Show you that there's also an o-ring seat that the canister seals against. Here you see the bottom side of the oil filter. When removing the oil filter Again, you'll see the uh, bottom surface and the O-ring around the outside edge that the canister seals against. Again, we'll reposition the canister, put the bolts back into place. Inside of this upper head portion of this oil filter is a thermostat. This thermostat controls the flow of the oil that's coming from the oil reservoir tank. If the oil is hot above 170 or so degrees Fahrenheit, the oil will travel through the cooler because this thermostat will snap shut. If the oil is cool under 170 degrees, it'll just flow straight through the thermostat down into the filter housing through the oil filter, back out of the filter and then down through this line to lubricate and cool the air compressor, the rotary screw air compressor. But if the oil is hot, as I said, this thermostat will snap shut. When that thermostat snaps shut, 
It forces the oil through the cooler where it's cooled by water pump flow from the discharge side of the water pump back through the suction, back into the suction side of the water pump. And um, that cools the oil. And then when it comes out, it's cooled. It comes back in through this side of the pipe, through this side of the filter, through the bypass side of the thermostat, down through the oil filter, filtered, and then back to the air compressor for cooling and lubrication. Now this housing is aluminum. You'll want to tighten up these bolts sufficiently, but not excessively. Because remember, you do have an O-ring seal. You just need to snug these bolts up. I would guess probably around 10 foot-pounds or so. That should do it. Now I'm going to show you how to check and maintain the oil level on your LDMBC. Shown here is the oil reservoir for the 220 CFM rotary screw air compressor. The oil level itself is checked by using this sight glass or sight tube. Anytime the oil level is anywhere between the minimum and the maximum mark, you have an adequate amount of oil in the system for cooling and lubrication. We recommend keeping the oil level at half sight tube coverage or one half and you check it when the system is shut off and has been shut off and blown down for at least five minutes. To add oil, you simply remove the fill port plug on models that have this fill port plug installed. You remove the plug and there is a gasket with an O-ring seat and then you would just add your oil into this fill port until you get to the level desired and again half full on this sight tube is desired. To drain the oil in this oil reservoir you would locate the hose that's connected to the valve on the bottom of the oil reservoir and to drain the system you simply put your tube down at a low point into your catch container and open this quarter turn valve and when opening this valve you'll draw the oil out through this clear plastic tube and into your container. When the system's completely all drained out, you can then shut the valve, wait for your, for your line to completely stop dripping, and then reposition it into a location up and above the, the uh, point. It's a good idea to put some type of a plug in the end of that drain hose to eliminate debris from falling inside that hose. And then to refill the reservoir, once again, remove the plug. Be sure to hang on to that washer with seat. Add the oil required to fill up the reservoir. And that's approximately 12 quarts or 3 gallons of oil. The oil used is a 32 weight ISO viscosity grade 32 designed for hydraulic systems or air compressors, rotary screw or rotary vane type compressor systems. And then when you're all done, be sure that your, be sure that your, um, your uh, gasket with the seat remains in position as you tighten it into place. And there it seats back into position and make sure you use a 19 millimeter wrench to thoroughly snug up that plug, probably about 25 to 30 foot-pounds. The next thing I want to demonstrate is how to change and replace the separator cartridges in the upper portion of this LDMBC oil reservoir. The upper portion of the oil reservoir, or this tank, is the storage location for two of the separator cartridges which remove the oil, the oil mist from the compressed air discharge that comes into the side of the tank after being discharged out of the rotors of the compressor. The oil and air, um, the oil mist that's trapped in the air travels through the upper portion of this tank where it's stripped out using these filters, these separator filters, and then is returned back into the system through a vacuum port on the back side of the air compressor. Now first to access 
these filters, you'll re need to remove the discharge head. Let's first remove the, the air outlet hose from the top of the outlet. And then we need to remove the two um, nuts, the nylock self-locking nuts from the top of the discharge head using a 19 millimeter um, socket, either a deep well socket or a wrench to uh, remove these nuts. It's a good idea to loosen them both before removing them. There is a slight amount of pressure, spring pressure, in this discharge head. Again, we're removing the nylock nuts and, and the washers that hold the discharge head into place. Loosen up the nuts, take them off these stud stems, set them aside. And you can remove the bar that holds the discharge head on. Grab it firmly and you'll want to just kind of give it a little bit of a jostle side to side. This entire head sits inside of the oil reservoir and there's a, an O-ring seal that holds the head into place. And you want to be careful not to damage this O-ring all the way around the surface of this discharge head. And then just set it off to the side and for the time being while we remove the separator cartridges from inside. Again, just set it off to the side while you're removing the cartridges. Once the discharge head is removed, you can clearly see down into the inside of the oil reservoir where the two recessed socket head cap screws uh, support the upper portion into a pocket on the separator cartridge itself. We'll need to remove this socket head cap screw to be able to pull the separator cartridge up off of the, um, the stem and the o-ring gasket, the o-ring seal that support the separator cartridge in place. So we'll remove these two socket head cap screws that are recessed into this head then we can pull out the separator cartridges. Now we're going to remove the two recessed socket head cap screws. Now we're going to remove the recessed socket head cap screws that support and hold the upper portion of the separator filters. It's best to use a 3 8 drive ratchet with a 10 millimeter with a 10 millimeter um, Allen wrench type uh, socket. You need a 10 millimeter to properly fit inside of the socket and when removing these you'll want to give the you'll want to give the ratchet a good wrap to break that seat or to break it loose and then all you do is pull that socket head cap, cap screw out of position. Same with the other one. Get a good support on it, give it a good wrap to break it loose. And then when you pull those bolts out of the head, you want to be sure that you maintain the, the washer with the o-ring seal um, to replace when, um, when you pull, put the new separator cartridge back in. Pull the other one out and again pay particular attention to the condition of the washer and the o-ring seal and then set it aside. And then you just reach inside the tank, firmly grasp the separator cartridge and wiggle it side to side in a 360 degree motion. Just keep wiggling it side to side and pulling it up off of its seat. And then you can, once it's up off its seat, then you can pull the separator cartridge from the housing and you can see the o-ring that the separator cartridge used to be housed onto. 
there's a port inside that you push this separator cartridge down onto to uh, fit it into place. I'm going to pull one of the filters out of the inside of the oil reservoir and show you the position where that oil reservoir or that separator cartridge used to sit down in the oil reservoir. And there's one on the one side as well as one on the other side. Here's a view looking down on the inside of the oil reservoir and you can see one of the two stems to the left where the oil separator cartridge is positioned. You would push it by a pressure fit on that o-ring down onto that stem and then to the right you see the, the uh, sump strainer that under vacuum will suck the oil that's removed by these separator cartridges out out of the upper portion of this oil reservoir and return it back into a vacuum port on the side of the air compressor. So now to replace the separator cartridge all I'm going to do is push it back down through this hole and press it onto that stem, the one of the two dark raised stems that's protruding through the bottom of this uh, floor on the separator tank. When installing the separator cartridge, it's a good idea to put a small film of oil and lube this O-ring thoroughly so that when putting it down into the inside of the reservoir, it'll easily slide onto the, the stem where it needs to be positioned. And again, grab a hold of it firmly, give it a light 360 degree rotation, and press it down into place. There. And then using the two bolts that you removed, as long as the O-ring seat is good on the washer, you will then just put it back into place and tighten it into position. Same on both sides. Here you see the position locators being tightened down in where they then will fit right into the cup on the top of the separator cartridge. And just take your 10 millimeter Allen ratchet again, tighten it up, get them good and snug, we don't want any oil mist or any air leaking from these two bolt heads and again probably about 40 foot pounds to tighten up those two socket head cap screws. When reinstalling your discharge head onto the top of the oil reservoir you want to pay particular attention to mounting it back in the original location and you'll also want to be sure you have a good amount of oil lubricating this o-ring. Check the condition of that o-ring, make sure that it wasn't damaged during removal. Give a, put a good lube of, of oil, a film of oil on that o-ring so that it easily slides down into the discharge head and then carefully position the discharge head back into its original location. It's a good idea to mark the location of the discharge head before removing it from the oil reservoir so that you know you get it back into the original position so that everything lines up and that your discharge hose reconnects quite easily. Once you have it positioned in the proper location, give it a little bit of a, a wiggle and, and rotate it and press down until it fits back into the same position. Then you want to put your bracket back on top. Be sure that the U shape is pointing down 
to properly support and press down on the discharge head. Replace your washer and your nylock nut on each side. And then thoroughly tighten these nuts back into position using that 19 millimeter metric wrench. Or a socket. 19 millimeter socket would be the quickest way as long as you have a deep well. And even an air ratchet could speed this process up greatly. It's also important to note that when tightening these nuts, what you want to do is bring one down until it's until it's just contacting the washer. Don't tighten it up snug at this point. Just tighten it up so it's um, just touching the washer and then bring the other one down. You do not want to fully tighten one before bringing the, the second one down to a good snug position. Otherwise you can deflect this bracket and put the discharge head in at an angle and cant it which can cause sealing problems in that O-ring and can cause damage to the aluminum housing of the head. So you'll want to be sure that both, both uh, nuts are brought down and tightened equally back and forth to distribute the load of the bracket onto the discharge head. Now that one's starting to get snug, that one's getting snug, and then just an eighth of a turn to each of them until they're both good and snug. There. Then you can reposition your airflow meter if it's so equipped. Reposition your discharge hose, reconnect it to your output on your oil reservoir tank if you had to remove it to gain access to removing the head. Tighten everything back up and you're back into business with new separator cartridges. Now I'm going to show you how to remove and change the air filter. Now I'm going to show you how to replace the air filter on an LDM BC 220 CFM air compressor. This air compressor has two different types of inlet valves. This is what's known as the vertical inlet valve. The cover and the air filter have been cut away for easy visibility of the, the filtering system. To remove the canister, there are three clamps that need to be loosened and removed and held off to the side so that you can lift the canister cover off of the filter assembly. Now obviously this is showing it cut away, it would be a solid canister. Set it off to the side for the time being. Then there's a wing nut down inside of the filter cover that you need to remove and then you can lift the cover off of the air filter housing. Once again these are cut away for viewing purposes. Normally you would have either two separate cartridges, one on top of each other, or there's also a model air filter that's that's the full height of the one of both of these filters and it's a one single cartridge. So either way the filtration is the same whether you have uh, two filters stacked on top of each other or one large full-size filter you check them the same. and You want to check the condition of the pleats. If they're dirty, if there looks like there's a lot of debris inside of here, it's best just to remove them, discard it, and replace it with a new, new air filter. While you have the, the filter off, it might be a good idea to slightly wipe down the surface with a rag. Make sure that any debris that may have fallen into this area while you've taken the cover off or removed the filters is wiped free. A slight little um, a uh, blast of compressed air to clean off this surface and to keep this area clean and debris free is a good idea. You don't want anything going into the intake of your air compressor other than clean filtered air. 
to prolong the life of the air compressor, the oil filter, and the oil that's used to lubricate and cool the system. Once you have the entire area nice and clean, you can then replace either with one single filter or this stack type dual filter situation. You want to check the condition. There's an O-ring that goes all the way around the surface of this vertical air inlet valve. Check its condition before positioning your air filters back into place. You can then take your top hat or your filter cover, position it on top of your air filters, reposition your wing nut and tighten it into position. Tighten up the wing nut. Just good and snug to hold that filter into place and then you can replace your cover. Be sure that each one of the clamps gets the hook underneath the base of the air compressor and that there's no lines or tubing lines, or air pressure tubing lines or anything caught underneath the plate. Make sure it's free and you have a good clamping surface. Tighten it back up into position and now you have a new air filter. Here you can see a cutaway cross section of not only the air compressor rotors and the bearings that support the rotors but also the clutch and belt drive pulley system that drives the air compressor. When the impeller shaft is rotating and the clutch is engaged this entire mechanism will rotate and, and um, rotate the rotors in the air compressor to develop compressed air pressure. To check the tension of the belt, it's necessary to remove the belt cover. Removing these two nuts will remove the belt cover. Normally, obviously, this belt cover is completely um, encompassing and covering that entire belt assembly and drive pulleys to keep any fingers or, or debris from falling into that belt. That entire shroud would, be, would, would cover the entire area. So you need to remove these two nuts to pull this belt cover off and then you can check the tension of the belt. There should be very, very little deflection available, probably an eighth of an inch at the most under about a 20 foot pound pressure. It should be rather tight and the tightness is set by the position of the compressor. It slides up and down on an adjustable bracket. The adjustable bracket has four bolts holding the bracket to the pump gear case. To adjust the tension on the belt, you can remove or loosen those four bolts. When you loosen those four bolts, there's then um, bolts that are used to put pressure and you can actually pull the compressor down if the weight of the compressor itself isn't enough to put the proper tension on that belt. But it should be rather, rather tight. Shown here is the temperature probe that's threaded into a port on the back side of the air compressor. It sends a signal to the AutoCAF's commander telling it the temperature in either Fahrenheit or Celsius. Thermostat mounted to the side of the clutch to send a message as to the temperature of the clutch. This discharge port on the back side of the LDM discharge head is a screened port which provides a a water supply, a flow, a good dependable stream of water down through this line here which travels to our heat exchanger and the line back here on the suction guide comes back into our suction side of our water pump to provide a good sustained water flow to the heat exchanger on our cooling system for our compressor. 
Here's this one of the stainless steel foam manifolds for the Darley cap system. Shown here, the water pump discharge head supplies water into the manifold through a stainless steel spring-loaded flapper style check valve, through a groove vitalic. You have your foam injection fitting coming from the foam pro system. Then the water in the foam solution travels through the pipe to a flow meter where this paddle wheel flow meter sends a signal to the foam pump telling it how much foam to inject into this fitting to treat the gallons per minute of water flowing through these number of various discharges. As that foam water solution travels into the various discharges, you can then open and close your various gate valves. Let's say this one's traveling to an inch and three quarter cross lay. We have an inline check valve which keeps the water and foam solution flowing through the line and disallows any air that's injected into this line from getting back into the water pump. The air line coming from the air compressor is turned on and controlled at the pump panel and then when it's turned on the air is injected through a stainless steel basket type spring loaded check valve. The air is then injected into that water foam solution. Air can't get back because of this check valve. Water can't get into the air compressor due to this check valve and the equal pressure of water foam solution and compressed air travel together through the hose and make compressed air foam. After the separation of oil from the compressed air in the upper portion of the oil reservoir, the air travels up into the discharge head of the oil reservoir where it, there's a check valve called the minimum pressure maintaining valve that keeps the air pressure in the system at at least 60 to 65 psi. Once the system has achieved 60 to 65 psi of internal sump pressure, the air then travels out of the discharge head through the optional air flow meter if so equipped, through a distribution line, the main supply line that feeds the main manifold, and into a stainless steel air manifold where numerous air flow valves or lines are connected to supply air to the various CAFS discharges. These CAFS discharge air flow valves, as shown here, are electrically controlled using a toggle switch from the pump panel that when turned on would discharge air through these red hoses and into the specific discharge valve that's been chosen to discharge calves. In this situation, or in this mock-up, there are three different discharge valves, a two and a half and two two inch valves that are shown with the necessary check valves to supply compressed air foam. Here's the Darley AutoCast auto pressure balancing valve assembly. You can see the black 
diaphragm valve is being used to measure water pump pressure and then based on the pressure from the water pump it controls the air compressor pressure this is the manual pressure adjustment screw to set the maximum attainable pressure by the AutoCAF's air compressor system and the needle valve The needle valve shown here is what adjusts the sensitivity of the pressure balancing system. You can close it down completely and then open it one, two, and a half turns is the approximate setting.